Hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining me for this Spring Constellation show. I'm Josh Rebels, NASA Education Outreach Specialist at the Katherine Johnson NASA IVNV Facility Education Resource Center in Fairmont, West Virginia. And the intention of this session is to provide you with some stargazing tips, as well as knowledge that you can then translate to your real life location in the evening on a clear spring night. We'll be using Stellarium's free software, which you can later download onto your device and help you navigate the heavens. So you can access that link uh, in the description of this video or go to stellarium.org to find your download options. Now, before we begin, keep in mind that I'm located in Fairmont, West Virginia. So if you're watching this video, you're gonna be watching this from the perspective of the Northern Hemisphere and the United States at about 40 degrees latitude. So for a beginning astronomer, it's gonna be hard for you to find constellations without some star hopping techniques. And for people that live in the Northern Hemisphere, our main go-to for star hopping is the North Star and also uh, constellations such as Ursa Major or uh, the asterism within it known as the Big Dipper are all very helpful starting points for helping us locate other constellations in the northern hemisphere. So let's start by locating north and finding where the north star is. So when you go to your observation site, you need to keep in mind the direction in which the moon or the sun or the stars rise above that, the horizon. So the, they all rise from the eastern side of the, the horizon. This is due to Earth's rotation. So as Earth rotates, things in the sky appear to move from the east over to the west. And so that right away is going to help you figure out exactly where east and west are. So what about north and south? Well, you'll notice in the northern hemisphere at this particular latitude, when the sun rises and also uh, whenever the moon is rising, you can use it as well as kind of a reference point. You'll see that the sun comes up and it starts slowly drifting towards the southern end of the sky. And that's just because we're above the equator uh, and we're above the Tropic of Cancer. And so everything, uh, you know, along the ecliptic plane where the sun, the moon, the planets are uh, in the sky, they all seem to move towards the south because they're positioned over that region between the tropics or at the equator. So now that we know that this side over here is the south, we can actually just use the process of elimination to figure out that north is the only other direction that we haven't determined already. So we know east, we know this end is south, and we know that this side is the west because the sun, as, as we watch as the day passes, ends up moving into that position. Okay, and so now that we know exactly where our coordinates are, let's focus on finding the north star. So if I look up in the sky in the north, what am I looking for? Am I looking for the brightest star in the sky? Well, no, Polaris is actually not the brightest star in the sky. And so when you look around at these stars, you might be wondering, well, which one is it? Is it this one? Is it that one? Is it this one here? Uh, is it this one over here? Well, there's a couple different strategies that you can use to help you find the North Star. The first one is a little bit more difficult uh, than the, the second one that I'm going to give you. And so I'm just going to demonstrate here how the North Star is the only star in the sky that doesn't look like it changes position. Everything else is moving around it. And so if you watch the sky for hours and hours uh, continuously, you'll be able to witness that. And so you can see that this star right here is actually the North Pole Star. It's the only one that seems to remain stationary. And that's because it's positioned as close to being directly over the, the Earth's North Pole as possible. And so the North Pole doesn't actually rotate. Everything about the Earth rotates around that point, around the axis of rotation. And so the axis of rotation extends out towards the North Star. And so all these other stars seem to move as the Earth rotates, whereas the North Pole Star doesn't. So that's one way to find it. But again, that's gonna take a long period of observing for you to figure out which one is the North Star. And so there is a trusty trick that I have for you to help you 
figure that out. So if we look up into the sky, we're gonna be looking around the northern region for really bright stars that form a recognizable pattern. Okay, and so if we take a look around this object here probably looks really familiar to you. You probably know this as the Big Dipper. So the Big Dipper has stars that are relatively bright and they're close enough together that they form this pattern that's easily recognizable. So really to find the North Star on a night where you don't have a lot of time to sit and wait and watch, uh, you want to locate this constellation because it's gonna help you star hop your way to the North Star and also star hop your way to other constellations. And in particular, we're gonna use the North, uh, or sorry, we're gonna use Ursa Major's uh, Big Dipper in order to help us find all of our spring constellations. Okay, so I paused to rewind time a bit so that this represents what the sky will look like just after the sun goes down on a spring night. And so you'll notice that the Big Dipper shifted a little bit. And so why, why am I having you guys find the Big Dipper again? Well, remember that most of the stars are relatively bright. They have a visual magnitude of 1.85, making them brighter than the North Star when viewed from Earth. The North Pole Star, Polaris, only has a visual magnitude of 1.97. Now you might be thinking, uh, what is the reason behind 1.85 being brighter than 1.97? Well, this is actually because the first star catalog logged the brightest of stars with a ranking system that started with a number one, meaning that it was the brightest star in the sky. Whereas the second brightest star in the sky was given a visual, uh, visual brightness or visual magnitude of two. And so with better technology and measurements, we refine that system to now include decimals and also negative values. So for example, the sun, which is the brightest star in our sky, it has a visual magnitude of negative 26.7. And so in the Big Dipper, we find the stars Alcade, then Miser, Alioth, Megrez, Bad, which goes by many different names. Next to Fad is uh, Merrick, which I'm not getting a good click on. And then Dube is above it. And so these stars form what appears to be like a soup ladle, right? Where this is the handle of the Big Dipper. And then this is the trough where you would maybe fill your soup into and pour it into a bowl. And if we draw a straight line from Merrick through Dubé, we end up at this really uh, bright star, relatively bright star in the sky named Polaris, our North Pole star. So this is a really good technique for helping you find the North Pole. And Polaris is actually the tip of the Little Dipper. And so looking back at the Big Dipper, we see that it's actually part of a larger pattern of stars. Okay, and so this constellation is known as Ursa Major. And so I've been using the term asterism. And so asterisms are a small group of stars that are in a recognizable pattern within a constellation. They're not truly defined as constellations. So there are only 88 recognized constellations uh, in our sky for scientific purposes. And so the Big Dipper happens to just be an asterism. And so we actually recognize constellations uh, mainly from their Greek origins, right? The Greeks were so influential in starting everything that we you know, learned about astronomy and so just kind of out of respect, we, we keep the names of those for the constellations. And so when we take a look at the, the artwork for these constellations, you'll see that both the Little Dipper and the Big Dipper or Ursa Major, Ursa Minor uh, constellations, they uh, 
look like bears. And you might be wondering, wow, these bears have really long tails. And so the answer to why they have such long tails resides in a Greek myth of Callisto and her son Arcus. And so I'm going to read that uh, to you now. Zeus fell in love with a mortal woman and skilled huntress named Callisto. Zeus's wife Hera became jealous and cast a spell, changing Callisto into a bear. Hidden away in the forest, Callisto watched her son Arcus grow. One day, out on the hunt in the same forest, Arcus met a huge bear. Frightened by the great bear charging at Arcus and not knowing that it was his mother, Arcus pulled an arrow on his bow to protect himself. Overseeing the impending tragedy that was about to take place, Zeus decided he was going to intervene. And so he knew that he was unable to break the spell on Callisto. Instead, he turned Arcus into a smaller bear and then grabbed both bears by the tails swinging them around with his godlike strength, causing their tails to stretch. And he hurled them into the sky where they would be safe and immortal. However, Hera, still jealous and noticing this happening, wanted to get a chance to set the score on Callisto. And so she struck them on their way to the heavens, which moved them to the portion of the sky that never sets. So until the end of the world, Callisto and Arcus must endure weariness without rest. So you can see how, as time passes, these constellations appear to move in the sky. And some of these constellations in the northern hemisphere uh, do not seem to go below the horizon in the northern hemisphere. They're always cycling above the ground in the sky. And so all of these constellations move counterclockwise around Polaris, the North Pole Star. Uh, and if we look closer to the horizon, you'll see that, you know, Cassiopeia, Cephas, King Cephas, Queen Cassiopeia, uh, they, they are constellations that are not going to fall below the horizon. So they are also constellations like Ursa Major and Ursa Minor and Draco the Dragon, even, that never fall below the horizon. And these are known as circumpolar constellations. Now, if we look further to the east or to the west, you'll see that constellations do fall below the sky and are only visible at certain times of year in particular seasons in which they're favorably uh, seen at nighttime above the horizon. And so one of which is Bootes, which is here. And so Bootes is easiest to find in the spring, like late March, in April, just after sunset, as it comes up above the horizon. And so to locate the constellation, let's follow the handle of the asterism, the Big Dipper. So I'm gonna quickly turn these off as if we were outside actually doing this. And so remember the handle of the Big Dipper, our friends Alioth, Miser, al -Qaid. Well, they kind of make this arc in the handle of the Big Dipper. And so if we follow this arc uh, to this very bright orange star named Arcturus, we will have found the constellation Bootes. So again, it's follow the arc of the Big Dipper to Arcturus. And so Arcturus is the fifth brightest star in our sky and the very brightest star in the constellation Bootes and it has a visual magnitude of negative 0.05. And so to visualize this constellation, I like to think of kind of like a kite in the sky. This shape makes up the body of Bootes. The name Bootes, or Bootes, sorry, translates from Greek as herdsman. And so this constellation rising in the nighttime sky indicated to ancient folks that it was time to take their plows to the field and till up the soil. And so as, as spring is the time to plant seeds for the year, you can see that it appears that the herdsman hands are reaching out for the Big Dipper, which serves as his plow. Continuing on, we can see again uh, other constellations using Arcturus as our, our kind of guidepost.
Okay, and so once we've arced to Arcturus, now we're going to spike towards the south to Spica. And so Spica is this really pretty, brilliant blue color star. And it finds its home in the second largest constellation in the sky named Virgo. And it's named after Virgo, the goddess of harvest, which is shown as holding an ear of wheat. Greek mythology contains an origin story of the seasons. It begins when there was an eternal spring that existed all across the earth. That was until the ruler of the underworld abducted the maiden of spring and forced her to live in the underworld with him. The disappearance caused her mother to grow very uneasy and resulted in a very frigid and barren earth. In order to end the winter, Zeus, the ruler of the Greek gods, demanded the return of the spring maiden. And so in order to help with the dilemma, Zeus ordered that the spring maiden not to eat any food until she was safely returned to earth with her, with her mother. However, knowing that she would probably eat a pomegranate seed on the return to earth, the god of the underworld tricked her into breaking Zeus's order moments before she was returned. And so as a consequence, the spring maiden must be returned to the underworld for four months every year. And so now spring begins each year in the Northern Hemisphere when she is reunited with her mother and rises from below the horizon. So we're gonna move backwards in time a little bit to see just exactly when these constellations come up above the Eastern horizon. A lot of time has passed since I've started the show. So you'll see just as they are coming up above the eastern horizon is whenever the sun begins to set. And so this is now moving in forward time. And so this is what you would expect to see on a nice clear spring night. Just as the sun is going down, both Boates and Virgo are rising up above the horizon. And so this is why they're known as springtime constellations. Now, locating Virgo uh, in the spring is actually a really useful thing because there are a handful of meteor showers termed the Virginids, and they occur in this region in the sky. You can see where they're marked here. One of which peaks from April 7th to April 17th and produces five to 10 meteors per hour. So the virginids take place in different parts of the constellation and they start as early as January and last up until early May. So this would be a really great part of the sky to be looking at on a really clear night to, uh, in the spring to catch one of those meteor showers. Okay, there are some other constellations around Virgo that you may be interested in finding, like Corvus the Crow, uh, or this cup known as the Crater constellation. But maybe even more recognizable than those constellations would be this network of zigzagging stars, bright stars in the sky. This is the constellation Hydra, also known as the Water Snake. So that constellation may be a bit easier for you to locate because it covers such a wide swath of the sky and it also has some really bright stars helping you find this zigzag pattern. Okay, tune in next time as we take a look at summer constellations.